Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Ecofon's I Can't Wait to Get Back into the Office event. Following yesterday's really superb first sessions, firstly from Nigel Osland, who gave us a preview of his new book and talked a lot about how we take a more human centered approach to the way we design and use spaces. And then our afternoon session with Jack Harvey Clark, who did a fantastic job at really demystifying the new ISO 2295 standard and explaining how what a powerful standard it can be in helping deliver really great quality spaces. A reminder again that um, both of those sessions will be available still it's for those who couldn't make the sessions yesterday or those that want to go and have a recap about the topics and, and listen again. Both of the sessions and those of today will be available in the lobby for you to go back and view after the event. I'm delighted to say that today we have another two fascinating and brilliant presentations to bring to you. Uh, this afternoon's session, we've got Adrian Burton from Atomic, Atomic Weapons Establishment, AWE, and Paige Hosman from Ecofon, who will take us through their case study on designing for neurodiversity in a real-life AWE project. But first this morning, we will have Dr Peggy Roth from Leesman, who will present to us our latest trends in what purpose an office serves and what motivates employees to want to work in them, a key topic at the moment and really, really apt uh, kind of discussion to be having right now. I'm sure they agree really two really, really powerful topics and very, very interesting. My usual reminder at this point is that please take time to post questions. Um, there's a Q&A session at the end of each of the, the presentations and it'd be really great to get your inputs and thoughts and ideas that you might have or challenge some of the presentations to, to maybe dig a little bit deeper into what's being said in the, in the sessions today. It'd be really good if you take part and, uh, in posting questions in the chat box. So I'll now hand over to you to Paige Hosman, a workplace concept developer for Ecofon, We'll open today's uh, session. Over to you, Paige. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I just will note that for this afternoon's session, my colleague Andrea Harmon will host. And um, to introduce our speaker today, our first speaker today, I have to say that um, this is someone that I really admire. She's deeply passionate about employee workplace experience and the strategic role of workplaces in organizational success. As the Chief Insights and Research Officer at Leesman, she really has a deep understanding of the user perspective of the built environment. And her research just happens to include the world's largest independent workplace experience database, upwards of, I think, about a million respondents so far. It's, it's just amazing. And um, she'll reveal the latest trends, as, as Jonathan mentioned, in the data and share with us crucial factors that organizations need to consider for future workplace strategies. A big welcome, Dr. Peggy Roth. Thank you, Paige, and thank you for the, the kind uh, intro. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to, to present some really interesting data points and insights uh, with you and uh, for you to, today based on, uh, as, as Paige men mentioned, a, a massive database on how employees really are, are experiencing uh, both their office workplaces and their home environments. So what I'm going to talk about is really kind of look at, well, what what does an office really need to be delivering uh, in 2021 and, and beyond this? Um, before I go into those interesting data points, though, um, I want to give you a bit of a nutshell introduction to Eastman, who we are, what we do for, for any of those of you who uh, aren't too familiar with, uh, with what we do. So in a nutshell, at Leesman, we do just one thing. We measure the experience that employees have of the places where they work. Um, so we do nothing else. We're not consultants. We're not advisors. We're not um, designers. We, we don't run any workplace change programs or we, we also don't sell any furniture or anything else. We simply focus on doing a completely independent measure of how good is the environment that employees are working in. So you can kind of think of us as the, the radiographers of the workplace. So we take the x-ray but we're not then the doctors who lift up the scalpel and, and operate and basically you know, fix the problem in that sense. We leave that to the, the other experts. Now, the way we do this measurement um, is through the, uh, the, the way, the only way that I would argue you can measure someone's experience, it's by asking people. So we have um, a, a, some completely standardized online surveys through which we, uh, we collect this data. So it all started off with the Leesman Office Survey uh, back in 2010. 
um, that, as the name mentions, uh, measures the experience that people have of their office environments. And since 2010, we've collected a lot of data. We, we are fast approaching that million. Uh, currently, we are, we're up at um, way over 800,000 responses and more than 5,000 different office workplaces that we have measured. And that essentially allows us to do a lot of interesting things. Um, and, and you could kind of categorize it into three things that we, we are able to do. So with all that data, first of all, we can offer benchmarking. So any organization that runs our survey gets a, a comparison of their own results compared to our entire database. The second thing we can do is we can identify and give recognition to high performers. Uh, so we have a certification program called Leasman Plus, where any workplace that uh, meets certain criteria and gets a certain score is able to, to then be, be Leasman Plus certified, which is essentially your recognition from the people who matter most, the employees, to say that they find that this environment offers them a truly outstanding experience. Then the last thing we can do is, of course, we can crunch the numbers and, and look into what are all these employees telling us about workplace? What's working, what's not? Uh, so that's been one of our, our, um, uh, our, our things from the start, start of Leasman. We want to make this data as freely available as possible and share these insights so that when we're working towards our purpose of making workplaces better, we not only do it by helping individual organizations by measuring their workplaces, actually we're taking all that data and sharing it so that the entire uh, industry can, can develop and move forward and, uh, and create even better places for the employees. So briefly then, um, what is it that we're asking in the, in, in the survey? Uh, the Leasman Office uh, survey, as I mentioned, it's completely standardized. Uh, it has four sections, four main sections. Um, so we look at what are the activities that people do and how well does the office environment support employees in doing those activities. Uh, we have some more general statements where we ask things like, uh, does the workplace enable you to work productively? Are you proud of it? And so forth. And out of those two sections, we calculate our main KPI, which is called the LMI. It's an abbreviation from Leesman Index. It's a number from zero to 100, where the higher, the better. And I'm going to be referring to this LMI score uh, in, in the presentation. So keep in mind, the LMI is your overall experience score, and the higher, the better. Then in, in addition to that, uh, there's two more sections where we look at physical and service features. So which features do employees find are important in the environment, and, and how satisfied are they with those features? And now naturally we also have a, a big number of background questions, uh, some purely demographic, some more about where do you work so that, that then enable us to basically do internal comparisons in the data. Now, this was what we were focused on since 2010 and then along came the pandemic and all of a sudden we had all our clients uh, had, you know, were forced to send their employees to work from home. And, and some of these clients turned to us and said, you guys have been helping us um, uh, measuring our offices for quite a while, but now our employees are working from home and we have no idea how it's going for them. Can you help us? So back in March then, uh, we developed a new set of questions. Um, so the Leesman homeworking uh, questions where essentially we're measuring the experience that people have working from home. Uh, we kept the structure, we kept the questions as similar to the office survey as possible so that we're able to do really interesting comparisons between how one experiences the office and how one experiences working from home. So also here we have the exact same 21 activities, we have 10 impact statements, we calculate an LMI, but we call it the HLMI, and again I'm going to refer to this in the presentation as well, so keep in mind HLMI is the overall homeworking experience, and then we ask some questions about uh, features as well. Um, during 2010, uh, sorry, uh, during 2020, we collected about 160,000 responses to, to these questions, um, and, and we're actually up now uh, up way above 180,000. Um, but today I'm going to share some insights based on those first 160,000 responses that we collected. So that's a bit of background on us and, and why we have this data and what kind of data we have. Let's then start looking at what, what it's really telling us. So, um, so I wanted to share today some of the insights from our, our latest um, publication and, and the latest, uh, latest insights that we've published, where essentially we're saying that um, in order for an organization to really be future ready and, and to have figured out the new workplace experience landscape, 
there are three things that they really need to understand or start by understanding. That is their people, that's their places, and, and they also need to take into consideration the time aspect. So I'm going to talk through each of these one by one and basically present you with, with some data uh, as to why are, we, why are we saying this. And starting off then with the first one, the people focus. So we strongly think that any future ready organization really needs to understand um, their people because they need to understand the purpose of their workplace going forward. So what is their workplace? Why? Um, what, why, do, why are they going to have their workplaces and their office workplaces for going forward? The only way to understand that is to first understand your employees, and your people, and understand what they need and, and, um, and how uh, what they have currently is, is working for them or not. So let's start by looking at uh, some numbers then. And uh, starting off, in, in order to understand really what, what employees need, we need to first start to, by understanding how has this homeworking thing been working for people? And, and the best way really to look at what's the experience been overall for employees all over the world working from home? Uh, how have they experienced that? And the best way to look at it is, is by looking at that HLMI number that I, that I talked about. So the average HLMI score across all the 160,000 respondents to, to, the, to our questions sits at 74.0. Now, just to give you a bit of perspective, um, uh, where we draw the line of something being an outstanding experience is at 70. So basically we can say that on average, employees have ha actually had quite an outstanding experience working from home. Now, what that then means when we look closer at perhaps the most commonly added question to our survey at the moment, so I forgot to mention that even though our survey is standardized, uh, organizations can add additional questions at the end of the survey. And one of the most commonly added questions currently is a question about how many days per week do you see yourself working remotely or working in the office um, post COVID? So we collected nearly 50,000 responses to, to this question. How many days per week do you see yourself being in, in the office uh, post COVID? And only 15% of employees uh, say that they, they, they want to be back four to five days a week. So pretty much uh, almost or full time or, or nearly full time. And, and the more exact distribution looks like this. So we've got uh, the biggest chunk, 50, or nearly 50% who say they want to be back in the office two to three days a week which basically means you're working from working remotely two to three days a week. But we have as, as many as 37% who, who say that they only want to be back in the office maximum one day a week. Um, now, this is though general, and I, I do want to kind of put out a, a bit of a disclaimer here to say that this is now across multiple organizations, nearly 50,000 responses. This may not reflect the situation in your organization, uh, because there are a lot of things that actually have an impact on these numbers. But nonetheless, overall, uh, we, we do see that, um, I mean, employees have realized now or have, have uh, tested this homeworking thing and, and many of them have, have uh, had quite a good experience. And we see it in the number of, of people then wanting to, to be back in, in the office. But let's also have a look at, well, what are the things that have been working pretty well and not so well as we have been working from home? So generally, we can say that the things that pretty much consistently have been working well for employees working from home has been things like they find that they have access to the information they need. They find that their individual work is supported, which then relates back to the fact that they find that they, the home environment enables them to work productively. And we also, we've also found that um, different types of conversations and, and, and plan meetings, they have been well supported as we've been working from home. But not everything has been great. So on the right hand side now, we, we have those things that um, many employees have actually found quite challenging. Uh, so even though we have access to the information we need, we've found it more challenging to be sharing knowledge with our colleagues. And even though we can we find that we can do our individual work and we can be productive, we, we find that it's, it's a bit more challenging or it's a lot more challenging to collaborate and, and we don't feel connected to the organization and to our colleagues. And even though the more kind of structured and planned meetings are well supported, the more informal and ad hoc things and the social interaction has certainly been uh, a lot more challenging. And the, uh, the, the things on the right hand side are especially things that we've seen 
uh, we've seen bigger variations from one organization to another. So especially in certain some organizations, we've we've seen bigger challenges with with the things here on the right hand side. But again, I'm, I'm talking kind of generally, and, and I, I do want us to keep in mind that even though on average the homeworking experience has been pretty good with, with some challenges, as, as we can see here, um, we are all individuals and, and not everyone has had a great experience. So in fact, it, it's uh, about 21% of our respondents who have said um, that they, or have reported basically quite a, quite a poor experience working from home. So we naturally wanted to have a look at, well, what are the differences? Um, what, are, what are key drivers in terms of what things um, kind of determine your, your experience working from home? And we had identified um, especially three things that where we saw a difference in, in uh, the experience uh, of, um, of employees homeworking. So the first one being about the role that you do and the activities that you do. And, and especially how much variety you have in the activities that you do. So we call this activity complexity. And it's something that we calculate based on that activity question that I mentioned in the beginning that we have. So those employees who have more variety in their role, um, so they do more different types of activities, they typically have a slightly poorer experience working from home compared to those who have a more simple work profile and, and focus on doing just a few different things. It's easier for the environment to support their needs compared to how it is for those employees who, who, who do a lot of different types of things. The second thing we found was um, uh, what types of activities do you do? So is your, your activity profile more focused on doing individual work or more focused on doing collaborative work? So, so when we look at, at the so-called individual versus collaborative ratio, again, we very clearly saw that those employees who have a role that is more, uh, more kind of um, focused on doing or, or has more collabor collaboration, they have a poorer experience working from home quite naturally. And then those who have a more individually focused role, they have a better experience working from home. However, the third, third element is really perhaps the one that almost trumps them all and, and shows us the biggest variations in the experience. And that is simply what sort of environment do you have available to you when you're working from home? So where are you working from when you're working from home? And we see a very significant difference between those employees who are working from the dining table, the kitchen, the couch, somewhere that is actually not at all dedicated or meant for working compared to especially the other extreme those employees who have a, who have a, a room that they have been able to dedicate for working so it is actually an office at home that they uh, that they work from uh, so a big difference in the overall experience and this certainly when we look even uh, more detailed in, in in all of the questions in the survey we see a big difference between these two groups and, and one of the interesting differences that we see that I find really interesting is um, on the question about whether you find that when you're working from home, you're, you're able to, to maintain a healthy work-life balance. Uh, for those employees who work, who have an office at home, it's clearly a lot easier to basically at the, the end of the workday, you leave the room, you close the door and you switch off compared to those employees who are basically spending their evening in the same space as where they, they basically worked all day. Um, it, 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 it's clearly more difficult for them to, to be able to maintain a healthy work-life balance. And I, I do, I, I can relate and say that um, it, it may mean that you're kind of staying switched on all the time because you're still in that same space as, as uh, where you had all your meetings uh, over, over the course of the day. So what this then actually means for any organization thinking about, well, what should our future workplace landscape be? It does mean that when you're when you're thinking about the different uh, different options, essentially, or the different strategies that are are are, uh, are now kind of available, uh, whether it is a remote first strategy where you conclude that well, homeworking has been good, and let's do that more, uh, let's let's primarily do that also going forward, or whether it is actually you know what everyone back to the office, or something in between, some sort of a hybrid solution where, where your employees are using the office and the home, and perhaps also a hybrid solution with, with the third space, uh, perhaps some co-working space options. Basically, what solution is best for your organization? It depends on your people. And, and there's no one right 
solution that will fit all organizations. And in fact, I think there's not one solution that maybe is going to fit the entire organization. Uh, you may have certain functions, you may have certain teams, you may have certain individuals who, who basically have different requirements, different, uh, different setup at home and so forth. So even if you're looking at teams who are perhaps predominantly individually focused or, or their work is individually focused, there may be some team members in there who don't have a proper setup at home and are not able to, to create a proper setup at home they may actually still prefer an office first strategy for them. So what the right solution is, is, is there's no right solution basically. And, and even within one and the same organization, I do suspect that we're gonna see uh, some different, uh, different variations of, of, of what you're doing. But to make any decisions around this, you need to start by understanding your people. And that then brings us to the second, uh, second point or the, the second section where we look at the place we strongly think now more than ever that the future ready organization understands what sort of office workplaces they are providing to their employees. And they're also making sure that they're providing office workplaces that really are fit for purpose and provide uh, uh, an outstanding experience. And, and we, we go as far as saying go big or they will stay home. And I'll, I'll share some data with you just to, to show you why we're, we're saying that. So. If we have a bit of a look at a comparison between the experience employees have working in an office and working at home uh, and, and doing this by taking our entire home working data and then taking our entire office working or office uh, experience data, um, basically to represent the home on average and the office on average. The average experience at home, as I, I explained earlier on, was on, on average pretty outstanding. The average experience working uh, in the average office is, on the other hand, quite a lot uh, lower than that or poorer than that. So we have an average LMI score, uh, LMI experience score of 63.7, which is more than 10 points below the average home working experience. And what that then means when we look at another interesting question in, in, in our survey, which we do ask in both the home working and the, and the office question sets, does your environment enable you to work productively? Well, 64% of employees have said that their office environment enables them to work productively. Now compare that to home where it's 83%, so more, more than 20 points uh, bigger or, or, or bigger proportion who say that their home environment enables them to work productively. So we can kind of conclude that the average home that was actually designed for living is better at supporting work compared to the average office that was actually designed for working. Now, what this then looks like, if, if we look uh, into it in even more detail and we, we have a look at our um, uh, the, the activities that we ask about. So we've got the 21 activities listed here. Um, and then we've got two lines on the screen. I hope you can see the black, black line as well, even though it's uh, the, the background is a bit dark. Um, so we've got the gray line representing how well those activities are supported basically in the average office. And we've got the black line showing how those activities are supported in the average home. And you see that the crossing point is quite far to the left. Uh, so there's not actually that many activities that are better supported in the average office compared to the average home. And uh, to save you all from tilting your heads to, to look at what those activities are, I've listed them here. So um, these are the, the four activities that are better supported in the average office. And then when we look at the list of activities that are better supported in the average home, the list is actually quite a lot longer. Um, and again, to, to, re, to reinforce that point I made, it's kind of like the average home is better at supporting work compared to the average office. Now, this comparison becomes completely different if instead of comparing home to an average office, we actually compare it to outstanding offices and offices that offer a great experience. So this is where I bring in that Leesman Plus group. So I mentioned that we, we have the certification uh, and we use those workplaces that have been uh, Leesman Plus certified. We also use them as a benchmark group and as a research group. So, so we want to be able to understand, well, what makes an outstanding office and what sort of scores do outstanding offices uh, get? get? Um, so we can use that as a comparison as well. So if we then go in and go back to, look, to comparing those activities 
and we swap out the, the gray uh, average line here uh, and, and replace it by the outstanding workplace line, you see that the crossing point moved quite a lot further to the right. And if we here then list, well, what are, are the things that are better supported in the outstanding office compared to at home? Uh, the list is already quite a lot longer and, and actually it, it becomes quite more even with I think one, one activity more uh, better supported in the office compared to at home. The list that does provide quite an interesting insight though, uh, if you look at the, the, the list on the left-hand side, we see that the things that are, are still better supported at home are the things related to your individual work and, and things related to having different types of conversations and, and basically video conferences and audio conferences and so forth. Well, then on the right hand side, the things that are better supported in the outstanding office are more related to basically things that you do together with colleagues and, and kind of things related to, I guess, the social fabric uh, of the organization. So let's have a, a bit of a look then at, well, what is the difference then between an outstanding and an average office? And, and to do that, we, as I mentioned, we, we're going to use the, the Leesman Plus group. Um, and, and just to give a, a, give a bit of a shout out to, to those workplaces and those organizations that, that um, also in a, in a year of a pandemic uh, actually got their workplaces Leesman Plus certified. So last year we had seven workplaces that were certified. Uh, the list is usually quite a bit longer. So in 2019, it was 32 workplaces. But nonetheless, a bit of a shout out to, to these, uh, these organizations. And, and we'll see some of the scores from, from, uh, from these also in, in the next couple of, uh, a couple of slides. So let's have a look at, well, what's really the difference between um, a, the, an average office and an outstanding office in terms of what sort of outcomes you get? So if we start by looking at the two productivity questions that we ask about, so does the workplace enable you to work productively? And does it uh, enable you collectively, the, uh, basically the, the, the team to work productively? You'll see here what the difference really it can make to have an outstanding workplace. So the Leesman Global represents the entire database. And then you'll see that across the Leesman Plus workplaces, the number is quite a lot higher. And then to show you the art of the possible, we've also shown here what is the highest score that any of those seven Leesman Plus workplaces last year got on these questions. So 87% who said that they're able to work productively um, in, in the, the office and 88% and, and who said that they can work uh, productively as a team or as a collective in, in the best score that, uh, that, we, uh, that we recorded last year. Um, a few other differences and, and really to show you what basically, basically organizations could be missing out on if they were to go with a remote first strategy, because we know that the workplace can be a or it is essentially the physical manifestation of the organization. And, and uh, to have a workplace that really uh, your employees are proud of, that will have a big impact on how they connect with the organization and how they feel about the organization. And we certainly saw that this was a challenge when, when working from home. And again, then to, to show you some of the, the numbers of what the art of the possible is. So um, when, when across the entire database, um, We've got only 55% of employees saying that their workplace is a place they're proud to bring visitors to. 93% in the top performing Leesman Plus last year uh, said that their workplace is a place that they're, they're proud of. And 95% and said that they think the workplace has a positive impact on the corporate image of the organization. So big differences there. And, and yet uh, a couple of other uh, data points as well to give you a sense of, of the difference between really an outstanding and, and just an average office. Um, it can foster a sense of community, absolutely. So 61% say that in an average office uh, compared to 86% in, uh, in, in, in basically the best score that we, we uh, recorded last year. And also it provides a, an enjoyable environment to, to work in. So then you may think or may ask, well, what's the difference then between the average workplace and an outstanding office? Um, like what, what, what is it that they do differently? And one way for us to, to explore this um, by using our data is by looking at, well, where do we find the biggest differences in satisfaction with, with some of the other questions that we ask about? So what we've done here is then we've looked at the physical features that we ask about in the survey. There's 25 of them in total. Um, and, and the lines here again show the proportion of employees who are satisfied with the feature 
uh, in both the average office and in the outstanding offices. And as you can see, we've ranked the, the, uh, the, these uh, items in, in the order of, or the, based on the size of the gap between the two. And as you can tell, the biggest difference really between the most outstanding offices and uh, just the average office is in satisfaction with variety of different types of workspace. So that's really the biggest thing that the, those outstanding offices typically do consistently. They offer a variety of different types of workspace, which basically means that um, the, the, the workplace is able to accommodate employees in doing what, what they're meant to be doing. And, and the, they, they empower employees the, and, and give employees the choice to basically choose, well, what sort of setting is best uh, for whatever activity that I'm, I'm, I'm about to, to undertake. So biggest difference between just an average and an outstanding office is actually that uh, they are offering a variety of, of different types of workspace. Now, not everything is great even in the most outstanding offices. And I wanna highlight one, um, one other point here as well, which is something that we see quite consistently even in, in, the, in the most outstanding offices, even though they do get slightly better scores, um, we don't see absolutely outstanding scores and that's on noise levels. So that is something that certainly we, we, we have been talking about for a long time and we're still talking about it. Uh, it is a challenge in, in offices and it, it is something that certainly still we need to work on and, and we, we need to ensure that when we are designing those, those workplaces that we make, pay attention to this and make sure that, um, that we create an environment that, that also offers a, a good um, acoustic environment for the employees. And I think this is gonna become even more uh, important going forward than it, even though it has always been important, but it's gonna be even more important now, more than ever before, because first of all, employees have been become used to working from home, where as we see in the data, um, the things that are well supported are things that require acoustic privacy. Um, and second of all, we, 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 we're gonna have some different, uh, different ways of working where there's more video conferencing and so forth, which I think is going to put even more pressure on, on uh, uh, the, 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 the sound environment of, of the office. So this is certainly something that we want to flag and, and say even the best environments don't always get it right. So something we need to pay attention to. But nonetheless, if, if we then look at, so we see now the difference between an average office and an outstanding office. Uh, if we go back to that comparison to home then, um, and instead of comparing the, the home environment with, uh, with just the average office, we go back to comparing uh, it to, to uh, um, the, the, the outstanding offices, we see a completely different comparison here. So when 83% of employees say that their home environment enables them to work productively, 78% say that nearly the same amount, say that in, in outstanding offices. And especially if we compare to the, the, uh, the best score that we got last year, again, the comparison becomes completely different and the situation becomes completely different when you're thinking about what's gonna happen next. Uh, so again, if we go back to, to the, the comparison that we had on the activities, um, comparing outstanding office and, and, and home, what if actually the office is really outstanding? So it's, it's basically one that kind of scores the best scores that we've, we've recorded. When you're then thinking about, well, will employees want to work from home or will they want to work in the office? Well, it depends on what sort of office is on offer. And imagine then this, this comparison here, in this situation, actually, even though the home working experience has been fairly good on average. If that's the office, the, the light blue line here, that if that's the office that is on offer, actually, employees would actually be better, uh, better off um, uh, perhaps working more in the office. And um, you may then say, well, is it, is, is it fair to compare to, to the average home working experience when we're, we're comparing it to an outstanding office? Well, even if we compare it to an outstanding home working experience here, so just an example organization, uh, basically, the office is, is performing really well. Now, I am comp doing a comparison and, and it may come across as a bit of kind of it's office versus home or it's, it's either or, but naturally, I mean, um, the future of work is, is, is most likely a blend of the two. So, so I don't want you to think that it is either or. And in fact, if this was the situation for any organization where 
the light blue line shows the how your employees are experiencing uh, their office and the white line shows how they're experiencing working from home, then I mean, happy days, because it doesn't matter where your employees work, they're going to have a great experience regardless. And their, their work is going to be supported regardless of where they do uh, that work. However, what if instead the office looked like this? So the red line here now represents an actual office that we have uh, um, that we have uh, measured. It's by far not the, the poor score we've seen, but it's still a, fair, a fairly poor score. Uh, so this is an office that uh, had an LMI score just over 50. Uh, and here, if you, if you compare this then to the, the average homeworking experience, the question is, why, why would these employees want to come back to the office? Like, why would they go there uh, when, when basically pretty much everything that they do is better supported at home. And especially then if in this organization, the homeworking experience hasn't just been average, it's actually been outstanding, then the gap is even bigger. And, and I mean, these employees will need a proper reason to go back to the office. Um, and, and I would also suggest that in this sort of situation, the organization really needs to, to reassess and think, do we need our what, what do we need our offices for? Do we, you know, what do we want employees to come back to? And if we want people to come back to the office, we need to do something about it. We need to give them a reason to come back because I think that uh, long gone are the days where going into the office is kind of um, almost a routine and, and happens by default. Uh, you get up in the morning, you have a shower, you have breakfast, and you go to the office. Um, employees now have the choice. And it's going to basically be a, almost a daily, a daily decision. Do I work from home or do I go to the office? And, and to go to the office, you're going to need a reason. You're going to need a purpose to go to the office. It's not going to happen by default. And especially not if this is the sort of experience that is waiting for you in the office. Now, lastly, I also wanted to give a, a show a comparison and just to make sure that it, it doesn't come across as all homeworking experience has been outstanding. We have also seen situations where actually the homeworking experience is not all that great. So in that case, I mean, this, this example here where the yellow line is uh, a poor homeworking experience, and then we're comparing that to an average home, uh, office experience. Actually, in this situation, um, it could be that employees are actually quite happy to come back to the office because their homeworking experience has been so poor. So it's really about kind of understanding the balance between the two and understanding how how they compare, even though we're, we're not, uh, I'm, I'm not saying to put them kind of uh, um, against each other in, in, in that sense. So that then leads me to the last, uh, last point I wanted to make, which is, is to talk about time and, and, and basically the fact that the time to act on this is, is really now, uh, because we've, we have uh, employees who, have, who now have higher expectations and, and uh, at the same time, basically, vaccines are being rolled out, and and we are seeing, uh, you know, a lot of light at the end of the tunnel. It's it's uh, it's only a matter of time now before before uh, COVID is not going to be posing that many restrictions on where we work, and and you need to be prepared for that. Um, so a few data points here as well. One interesting fact is that when we looked at our data pre-pandemic or most recently pre-pandemic, so those. 235,000 responses that we collected in just 2019, 50% of employees said that they never worked from home. So basically they worked 0% of their time from home. Now, most of these employees will now have tried it. And chances are that they will have had on average a fairly good experience. So they are now sitting on much, much higher expectations on what they expect from the office. And, and also, I want to put it out there that these employees, since they have had, a, a, on average, a, most likely a fairly good experience, uh, they also have quite higher expectations on, let's say, being allowed to, to work from home going forward. So if 50% never work from home, some of them most like or could have been likely because the organization didn't support that and it was not allowed to be working from home you can't really go back to saying it's not possible to work from home anymore because everyone's, or not everyone, nearly everyone has tried home working. And, and as I said, on average, um, they've, they've had a quite a good experience doing it. So 
expectations are much higher than they ever were before. And also, uh, employees have had, as I said, a fairly good experience working from home and especially doing those sort of things that require acoustic privacy. So these are, are uh, uh, some of those activities and, and how well they're supported at home. So 90% of employees say that reading uh, as an activity is well supported when, when working from home. Um, same thing with thinking, creative thinking, and also, as I mentioned, the different types of conversations you have. Uh, now, coming back to the office, again, employees will have higher expectations. Um, they've been used to it being very well supported when they're working from home. They're not going to want to be back in an office where really you have to run around for, for, for 10 minutes to find somewhere to have a co telephone conversation because they become used to it, just being able to do it where, where they're doing it uh, or where, where, they, where they're sitting or, or uh, are located at uh, that point. So higher expectations also on this. And then we also need to be mindful that some of the things and how we work have changed. And perhaps the most evident example of this is video conferencing. So again, when we looked at the, the data that we collected in 2010, uh, 2019, um, and we look at how many, uh, what proportion of employees say that video conferencing is important. 40% said that video conferencing is important uh, pre-pandemic. Now, during 2020, um, this number has increased. So 53% say that video conferencing is important. If you ask me, I would actually have thought that it would have become even more important than this. Um, and and we, as a side note, we did have a look at who are the people who don't have video conferences and, and are not engaged in, or, or are not uh, considering video conferencing to be important as a part of their role at the moment. And, and it was especially quite perhaps uh, naturally, those employees who have roles that are more focused on individual work, um, who then don't, don't see video conferencing as, as, uh, as being important. But nonetheless, I do believe strongly that, um, I mean, video conferencing, we know it, it's self-evident, we're doing it more now. I also don't think that it's gonna go back to the level where it was before. Um, so it's still gonna be important, especially if we're working in a hybrid way where we have some people remote and some people in the office, video conferencing is gonna happen more frequently than it did uh, pre-pandemic. And, um, and, and basically that means we, we need offices to support that, especially as we've had quite a good experience in, with our video conferences at home. So 89% of employees say that video conferencing is supported when they're working from home, compared to 69% who said that about their office pre-pandemic. So higher expectations there as well. Um, and and um, as, as I mentioned, kind of relating back to, to noise levels, I think this is, a, this is gonna be an issue or this is gonna be a challenge that, that uh, we, we do need to think about um, in terms of what do the offices need to look like when, when employees are uh, returning. Now then also, if, if we go back to the question about um, how many days per week you, you, work, um, you wanna work in, in, the, in the workplace uh, post COVID, um, I mentioned in the beginning that um, the numbers I shared were overall and, and kind of average in, in that sense. Um, there's, there's a lot of variation in, in, in those numbers. And here, for example, if we look at um, the, the uh, comparison between uh, an employee's experience at home and in the office, then naturally that's going to have an impact on how much they want to be back in the office. So the way to read this chart is at the top, you've got those employees who've said that they wanna be back in the office maximum one day a week. Now you see that the biggest proportion of those employees are employees who have a higher HLMI, so a higher homeworking experience compared to their office experience. And if you then look at um, uh, the, the bottom one, so those who want to be back in the office more, well, quite naturally, they're the ones who, in comparison, have a better experience of their office compared to what, uh, uh, what sort of experience they have uh, working from home. So, so we really need to be mindful when thinking about the future. We, we really need to be mindful of both. Well, what, what are the two alternatives or perhaps more alternatives, but how do the office and the home compare? And, and, and this is really why we need to make put emphasis. If we want employees to be back in the office, we really need to make sure that those offices are places they want to come to. So 
with that also then sharing a more practical or even a more more concrete example from one of our uh, one, one of the organizations that we worked with where we ran the survey across multiple locations multiple offices uh, globally and um, they also then asked how many days per week do you want to do you want to be back in the office and we pulled out three different offices that had three very different LMI experience scores and then we looked at how does the how do the answers to this question vary based on what sort of experience employees um, employees have uh, of, of their office and this is what it looks like so at the top you've got an office that is is um, providing an outstanding experience um, it, it has an LMI that is um, nearly 80, which means really it's offering an, a, a really outstanding experience to the employees. And you can see that more than 90% of these employees actually want to be back in the office four days uh, or more. And, and then compare that especially to, to the one at the bottom where, uh, again, the LMI is, is not all that great. It's, uh, it's um, uh, way well below uh, 60 uh, in the mid 50s. And you'll see that a much bigger proportion of employees want to be working from home, uh, bigger proportions of, of, of their week. And, and only a, well, a much smaller proportion wants to be back in the, um, in the office for, for, uh, for four days a week uh, or more. So what sort of workplaces we're offering our employees kind of matters now more than, uh, more than ever before. And uh, really kind of to, to conclude and, and, and wrap up, uh, I wanna say that, I mean, we, we need to take this seriously and we, we, there, are, there is work to be done. So when we look at um, all the workplaces that we have measured um, and, and we distribute them across that LMI scale and, and look at uh, what proportion of workplaces have, have received outstanding scores and, and not so outstanding scores, what we see is that 76% of the, the office workplaces that we've measured are uh, basically delivering a sub outstanding experience to the employees. Uh, and, and now knowing that we, we have an, uh, or employees have a, a, an alternative that, um, that basically um, you know, gives them a, a, another choice and, and has also increased their expectations on the office, um, we really need to ensure that we create better workplaces going forward. So uh, if, you're, if you're an organization that um, you know, occupies a lot of uh, workplaces, please keep this in mind and have a think about what is the purpose really of your workplaces going forward and how do you make them places where employees want to go. And naturally, if you are a consultant or if you're a designer or a, a, uh, um, someone who's delivering uh, products related to, to workplaces, um, certainly help your clients create better workplaces because uh, we, we need to ensure that, uh, uh, that you know, these numbers get more even uh, going forward. So with that, I, I want to thank you. I hope you, you found the, the, the data interesting and um, happy to take some questions. And I, I think there may have been some questions coming in as well. So I'll, uh, I'll bring in Paige again and see whether, uh, what's, uh, whether there's been any questions or not. Thank you so much, Peggy. Absolutely brilliant. Really, really uh, important information um, as, as always. Yes, we do have questions. Um, so I'll get started with that. So the first question we have is um, from Matt Casanadri and he's asked, can you see co-working being as strong as it was sort of pre-pandemic? -pre -pre um, I think he means co-working spaces and uh, that option to, to work. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I do uh, in, in the sense that I, I think and I'm, I'm hearing even of, of organizations who are, are kind of um, bringing that in as an option uh, mm. to complement um, the, the uh, basically the hybrid uh, work strategy. So, mm. so that it, it's uh, for the employees is not it's not kind of a, a matter of do you go into the corporate office or do you stay and work from home, but actually there's another choice where uh, where where you you can work somewhere closer perhaps to home uh, yeah. so so especially for those employees who um, perhaps have a long commute and and would want to work from home uh, on, on a particular day however they don't have the proper setup at home so their home environment is not good it kind of could offer a, a kind of an alternative 
which is not going all the way into to the corporate office. So being remote, but still having the benefit of, uh, of an office. So we are certainly hearing of, of uh, those sort of solutions. And, and then I think just generally, I mean, I don't see any reason why co-working um, wouldn't be an option going forward um, due, due to COVID. So, but, but I, I think co-working as, I mean, um, in many times co-working has been kind of thought of as uh, the place for startups and small organizations and so forth, yeah. but but actually I, I think it's it's also an option for for larger organizations to offer that as a as a kind of a complementary uh, place to to not just the uh, the um, uh, the corporate office. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So now we have another uh, two part question. Do Leesman um, do any analysis on how LMI correlates to HR me measures such as engagement or retention? Um, and then do you want to answer that one and then I'll go to the yeah, second. Yeah, sure. Uh, so so we, we I mean, we love data. And, and if uh, an organization wants to provide us with their HR uh, uh, data, uh, so engagement scores, for example, we, we would love to, to run analysis on that. Unfortunately, it's not something that we can do consistently because we we don't have consistent standardized HR data from organizations that we work with uh, in the same way as the Leesman data is standardized and, and basically everyone has responded to the same questions. However, for individual clients, we're, we're happy to do those, those sort of uh, uh, correlations. And, and that is certainly something that many of the organizations that we work with um, yeah. They will take their leaseman data and they will then combine it with all other types of data sources that they have and, and look at correlations and, for example, look at, um, at, at, at things like uh, engagement. Uh, we once did actually a, a bit of a comparison between um, absenteeism rates and, and, mm. uh, and, and the LMI scores in different buildings and found some quite interesting correlation there for, for one particular client. So. We're happy to do it, but it's unfortunately not something that we can do consistently just simply because we don't have consistent data on that. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And the second part of the question, uh, doesn't the office have, uh, have to be much better than home to overcome the wider work-life balance factors such as commuting, cost, and time? It's, it's a good... Um... It's a good reflection. Um, I, I think that really depends on the situation. Um, uh, and and in fact, I mean, for, for some employees, as, as I mentioned, um, when when home working from home doesn't offer you or doesn't enable you to uh, to maintain a healthy work life balance, actually going into the office could be that thing that enables you to to have a healthier work life balance. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but yeah, to to the point that I, I was making that um, I certainly think that. Um, employees will need that purpose to go into the office, partly also because of the, the, the reason that going to the office that does involve a commute. Um, but I, I wouldn't also think about the commute completely as a, as a negative aspect. Um, you know, that there are ways of using it in, in your advantage. And, and for some people, it's really, that is kind of the switch on and switch off, uh, reset uh, time in between uh, work and, and, and life. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's good. Okay, we've got another question from Matt Green. Uh, if employees are offered complete choice to work wherever, whenever, are we at risk of ending up with a midweek peak? And then we have empty offices Monday and Friday. I think we are at a risk. Uh, I think that this is something that many organizations are kind of currently scratching their head uh, uh, around and, and, and trying mm -hmm. to figure out how, we, how do we balance the load? Um, do we create like, I don't know, uh, fight a Fridays and things like that to get people mm -hmm. to come to the office. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I, I think it, it, it will be it, or it may be a challenge in, in some mm -hmm. organizations. I think in one way, perhaps even traffic could help balance that though, because yeah. if everyone goes into the office Tuesday to Thursday, then in, in places where there is a heavy traffic, perhaps some people will soon realize that actually going into the office on a Monday or Friday is much easier because, uh, because you know, traffic is light on those or lighter on, on, on those days. But I do think it, it is a, it, it's a real challenge um, that organizations uh, will need to, to figure out. And um, I mean, me personally, I like to, I'm, I'm, I am an advocate of, of giving people choice and, and empowering people. Um, and, and trusting people to do, do what's best. 
but but somehow it needs to be needs to be to be balanced as well so perhaps it is mm. a matter of you know trusting the employees that they will do what's best for the collective so you you kind of you you even though you have choice you do have to coordinate that with when is your colleague in because there's no point in if if yeah. you know you're in on monday i'm in on tuesday and then that person is in on wednesday then we're not going to be able to collaborate even though we're in the office so uh, so perhaps it is about somehow empowering and helping the, the employees to balance the the me against the we and and yeah. uh, and and get to a solution through that yeah. so matt peggy four day work week <laughs> <laughs> The, the movement, the movement is upon us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that's interesting because I think what it also what it's telling us is if um, and with Matt's question here, it's okay. So, in, and you say, yeah, this midweek peak is a reality. Um, what is that? When we look deeper at it, what is that telling us about how people work and how how they want to work? Um, I think that's a really fascinating subject in and of itself, uh, just looking deeper into that. Um, okay, so I've got another question for you. Um, and, and this is, you, you did, you covered this in your presentation. Um, and I'm just kind of, I'm kind of going back to it because um, we've seen that there's, because the, the data is showing us that that collaborative type work is, is what's well supported in the office. And then but we see almost a, uh, almost a drive to create the, the offices post pandemic as that's all they do is support the collaborative work. And I'm just, I, I guess this question kind of goes back and, and just kind of to reiter reiterate that point. Um, you know, so if, you, if the individual work is better supported at home, does that mean that, the, you know, that these traditional offices are, are gonna be able to support are they going to need to support the individual work at all? Um, I just, I think that's just kind of a reiteration of some of the things that you've said, just to hone in on that point. Yeah, no, it, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question because I think this is a really important subject because even though that's what the data is showing that uh, home generally is better at supporting individual and, and, and of course the, the office then is supporting collaborative, yeah. I strongly would, uh, uh, recommend not to go down the route of creating the offices just for collaboration and it's for two reasons um, mm -hmm. one if first of all um, our data shows that over 20 percent of employees have, have not had a great experience working from home um, mm -hmm. and and if they're in the office chances are they're going to be doing some individual work uh, over 90 percent of, of respondents in our survey say that individual focused work that is desk based is important to them so it's it's kind of a very hygiene factor of work it's something that pretty much every single knowledge worker does so those employees who have not had a great experience working from home they need somewhere to do it and second even the people who work perhaps more balanced and work from home as well if you just think about the and the average day in a knowledge worker's life um, it's, it may be quite challenging to organize your work so that you have days of full collaboration and socializing and so forth. And then you're gonna have days when you do nothing but head down and focus and don't speak to anyone kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's, it, even when you're, even if you're in the office predominantly for some meetings, chances are you're gonna have some time in between where you need to, to put your head down and do some focused work or, or, or uh, get a few things done in, in, you know, in, 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 in a focused manner. Um, so I do think that the, the most outstanding workplaces in the future, they, they do still support both collaboration and coming together and individual work. Perhaps the ratio between the two and, and the nature of the, 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 the two, well, that may depend depending on how hybrid um, the, the way of working is. Mm -hmm. um, but I would strongly, as I said, advise not to go down the route of creating workplaces just where, where basically you cannot do any sort of individual focused work at all. Okay, all right, good. And then real quick, because we're just about to run out of time. Um, Leesman's coming up on a million respondents <laughs> and the work is amazing. What's next for Leesman? What does the future hold? So, I mean, well, first of all, this whole homeworking thing has been really interesting. I think back uh, 12 months from now when we started getting in the, the first first data points, and that was a really, really interesting uh, kind of new new um, thing to be exploring. So, so that's been really exciting. But what's coming up next, I mean, we've got um, 
So we've been focused on doing a holistic measurement in one go, basically to give mm -hmm. you an overall uh, a, a wide data set that you can do your make your strategic strategic decisions on. Now, mm -hmm. something that we're coming up with now um, in, in the near future is is basically something that helps you in between. So more so of an ongoing assessment um, where where you you can kind of check in on employees on a on a bit more of an ongoing uh, basis rather than. Uh, only the the kind of annual an annual big uh, big exploration. So uh, so more on that to, to to come. Stay stay tuned. But that's that's really exciting because that's really something that's going to complement. You know when you're you, when you want to stay in tune in with uh, your employees' experience, you want to do it holistically, yeah. and then you also have a, a, a way of doing it kind of uh, on a monitoring monitoring it in detail on an ongoing basis. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's lovely to see you. Absolutely Thank you. brilliant. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Um, I'd also just really quickly like to give a big thanks to my colleagues uh, for their tremendous efforts that have brought this event together. So Kat, a big thanks, Gary, Mark, Andrea, Jonathan, and of course to our digital, digital platform creators, the organizers, uh, Emerald Color, who I think have done a brilliant job. Join us uh, here this afternoon at 2.30 uh, to hear Adrian Burton and I present on the AWE case study where we explore office and acoustic design for the neurodiverse worker. Um, and we're specifically looking at autism and sensory sensitivities. And in the meantime, feel free to peruse the rooms of the lobby and we'll see you all this afternoon. Thanks very much. Bye.